All right, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to our webinar on um, international investment law as a barrier to climate ambition in Africa. My name is Dr. Melanie Mercott, and I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Pretoria, where I teach environmental law and administrative law, but I'm also the vice chairperson of the Environmental Law Association of South Africa, and i um, very privileged to be chairing this session today. And um, we have two wonderful speakers who are members of our Gauteng subcommittee of the Environmental Law Association. And um, they are helping us as the Environmental Law Association fulfill our mandate of advancing knowledge about environmental law amongst the, the broader public. And in a time of, of pandemic where we can do this or where the norm has become to do this online, we are very privileged to be able to reach a much broader audience, including from around the world. And, and we would love it if you would um, introduce yourselves in the chat and, and let us know where you're from and what it is you're doing. And, um, and also, if as we speak, you can share questions and, and thoughts on, on the presenters' views. It's, uh, it's important for me to introduce both of our speakers properly, although they have introduced themselves briefly in the chat. Um, so we first of all have um, Dr. Jenny Hall, who's a senior lecturer in international environmental law and legal skills at the University of Johannesburg. And before joining the university in 2018, Jenny consulted for many years um, to a range of sectors. And in this time, she drafted several pieces of legislation for government, including the Air Quality Act and the Waste Act, which are two of our most important pieces of environmental legislation in South Africa. Jenny's also been intimately involved in a number of policy and strategy processes, including a project manager and lead drafter of the National Compliance Monitoring Enforcement Strategy 2014 for the Department of Environmental Affairs. Jenny holds a, a BA, an LLB, an LLM, and a PhD, and um, her PhD was on the impact of judicial control on the public administration of the environment uh, from 1995 to 2007. Then we have um, Louis Kuhn, who's an assistant lecturer and doctoral candidate in the Faculty of Law at the University of Joburg. His research primarily focuses on the interaction between sustainable development, including attaining decent work in international economic law. Um, he focuses on how the branches of international economic law can contribute to or undermine the achievement of sustainable development with a special focus on vulnerable groups such as informal economy workers. He has presented at various international and local conferences on sustainable development, labor and international economic law and publishes on these topics. And um, Louis is very much an emerging scholar in um, international law and in international environmental law, hopefully from my perspective. And um, I think I'm very excited to hear his thoughts because um, I'm hoping that will be part of, of thought leadership and climate ambition in Africa um, as you move forward in your very exciting career. And um, so with that uh, short introduction, I, I'm really excited to hear the thoughts on, on international law and climate ambition. These are not ideas that are often brought together and um, bringing different fields together is something that we increasingly need to do if we're going to respond to our global climate crisis. And, um, and so I'll hand over to Jenny and Louis to speak. But before I do, I'd just like to remind you of, of the normal Zoom etiquette that we've all become used to, that during the presentations, you keep your mics off. Um, and um, also uh, just a reminder that the session is recorded and we will be sharing it on our YouTube channel after the, the Zoom has, has finished. And um, so if you have any privacy concerns, please ensure that your 
profile is anon anonymized so that um, your privacy is, is protected. And um, yeah, over then to Jenny and, and thank you all for joining us. Hey, thank you. Thanks for that, Melanie. And um, <clears throat> just going to start sharing my screen, which seems to have got jammed. Uh, there we go. Um, and from our side, also, Louis and I know I can speak on behalf of us. Thank you for being here. And um, we're quite excited to be speaking to you. What we're going to be talking about today um, comes out of some interdisciplinary research that the two of us have been doing for uh, most of the year actually now and that's the intersection of international investment law and and international environmental law and i must be honest we've become a little bit like dogs with a bone on the topic we can't let it go we phone each other many nights late into the night and we've got to a stage i think where we finish each other's sentences cite each other's sources back at each other and can be quite a handful um, <clears throat> if you're a fly on the wall and in those discussions. So we're hoping that some of the enthusiasm we have will be infectious, but we also know that we need to be disciplined because as I say, we've got into this habit of sharing thoughts, uh, finishing sentences and, and so on. So we're going to speak sequentially and um, be very disciplined and just look at one aspect of our research. So we're going to be taking it through the lens of how does international investment law work with climate change? Where's the relevant? Where's the connection? And we've taken the example of gas flaring in Angola and Cameroon um, and juxtaposing that against stabilization clauses that um, both of those countries have in terms of their international investment law. And for those of you who are not environmental lawyers or not investment lawyers, we'll walk you through um, both disciplines as, as we go. Okay, so let's get started. I think those of you that are environmental lawyers will know that common but differentiated responsibilities has really been a core concept that's underpinned a lot of the climate negotiations. And the argument or, or, or the terrain of struggle there initially has been very much about developed countries have really contributed the most to causing the problem that we're in, and they must shoulder most of the responsibility um, for dealing with it. But as time has, has gone on, there has been a shift, as we'll see, and we've shifted that common but differentiated responsibilities, and we say um, all countries need to contribute to, to the struggle that we're having with climate change, and everybody needs to be engaged with, <clears throat> with it. And then the run-up to COP26 is definitely a call for countries to do a lot more and up their game and, and be more ambitious, but there's also recognition that it needs to extend to transnational corporations, those companies that um, operate in, in many, many different states, um, the so-called non-state actors, and that they also have to um, contribute to the struggle that we're having and the efforts that we're putting into looking at climate change. And this is, this is important because if we look at those companies, they currently contribute about a fifth um, of all the global greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change in the first place. And if we look, there's a limited amount of sectors, which is really um, sort of oil, cement, and so on. They've contributed 35% of all greenhouse gas emissions since 1965. And, and we know that these gases that are emitted hang around in the atmosphere for a long time. So they are more responsible for climate change than whole countries at a time. So we really need to be looking at that. Okay. Um, but what we see is that we need these companies to change the way they operate. So while we're asking governments to operate differently, we also need companies to operate differently and not do business as usual. And where they're reluctant to do so, we need countries to pass legislation and so on to make them do that. But where countries do do that, they can run into the obstacle 
of um, international investment law. And that's where, because where a company is protected by a bilateral investment uh, treaty, which we call BITS, and Louis and I both slip into acronyms. So a BIT is a bilateral investment treaty. Um, there can be all sorts of problems. And that's, in essence, a BIT is an agreement between two countries, which agrees how investment coming from one country into the host country will, will be protected. And very often a feature of these agreements is that they have uh, dispute resolution clauses um, and they agree to go to arbitration with various bodies, but the main one being something that we, we call exit. Now, where a company threatens to declare a dispute in terms of their bit because a uh, um, <clears throat> government has passed legislation, it's not a Mickey Mouse matter. Um, and it creates a chilling effect in itself. And that's because if we look in the case of Exit, which is the biggest body adjudicating this, 44% of all cases that they had in 2016 related to energy, they're very pro-investor friendly. A lot of the successes go in the direction of the investor. And where they do, the awards are high. They run into billions of rands, sometimes bigger than the entire economy of, of the host state, and it can absolutely paralyze them. And Louis will give you um, some examples of that in due course. So it's, it's a big deal when a company declares that. Okay. There's been quite a bit of research emerging on international investment tools and how that relates to environmental protection. But there's a real gap in the literature and that's why Louie and I decided to hone in on, on this today because it's an area that, that very little has been written uh, about. And that's the area of stabilization clauses. So stabilization clauses are clauses that are included in a bilateral investment treaty that give investment, uh, in, sorry, investors protection against any negative effects that they might experience as a result of legislative changes. Um, and they typically do this by saying, if there's a legislative change, the company doesn't have to comply with it, or if the company does have to comply with it, government has to pay and, and compensate them. <clears throat> sorry, I got a frog in my throat today. And uh, what I want to do next is just highlight some of the climate law issues that are relevant um, as a platform for moving into our analysis of international investment law. Um, the first thing that we need to note is that climate change law has got a very different in, uh, objective from international investment law. Climate law is focused on global interests. It's public law. It's about the good of all, um, whether you agree that it's successful or not is is another issue. Whereas international investment law is very much concerned with private interests and protecting individuals, individual companies right. Um, the most important legal instrument that we have in the climate law regime at the moment internationally is the Paris Agreement. And that's got three goals at the moment. The one uh, echoes the, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and it aims to hold global average temperature increases to below 2% above uh, pre-industrial levels um, and to strive to get them um, to 1.5%. And it's, as you'll know, if you've been following any of the media at the moment, with the various IPCC reports that have been coming out, we're not on track to do that by a long chalk. And that's why there's, there's a lot of pressure um, being placed on the upcoming discussions in COP26 in November this year for, for governments to do more. But the Paris Agreement also has two other goals. The one is almost acknowledging that um, we've opened a door and people are walking through it and we can't close it. And that's that countries need a better ability to adapt um, to climate change and, and to have climate resilience. And then importantly, from our side, to make sure that finance flows are consistent. And that's because we know that in addressing climate change, it's going to take a lot of money. Al Gore said years ago, I'm not sure if this audience even remembers who Al Gore is, but what he said years ago was 
this is not only the most important environmental convention, it's the most important economic convention. And that underlies a lot of the tensions that have happened in the negotiations. Right, so other things about the Paris Agreement that we need you to know is unlike its predecessor, the Kyoto Protocol, it adopts this bottoms-up approach. Um, and one aspect of the bottoms-up approach is that all countries have to do their bit in mitigating um, climate change, and this includes African countries like Angola and Cameroon, and they have to determine nationally determined contributions in which they set their own reduction targets. So this shows a shift in the common but differentiated responsibility approach where you're not just making it the responsibility of um, developed countries who've caused most of the problem to take on emission targets, but everybody has to do their bit and everybody has to, to pull together. What I might add here is when they do these nationally determined contributions, um, countries set up what they call conditional and unconditional targets. And the names kind of suggest what that means. Um, in terms of the unconditional targets, countries are saying, we will do this. We commit absolutely unqualified, where they take on conditional targets. They're saying, we'll do it, but we need something to be in place first. And that's typically something like um, financial support or technological support or so on. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know why this frog in my throat has decided to arrive right now. Other thing that we need you to know about the Paris Agreement is that it's a real mixture of non-law, soft law and hard law um, provisions. So when we're talking about non-law provisions, we're talking about those that you'll find in um, things like the preamble, they're quite contextual. Um, they give us a sense of the thinking of, of why the, the legal agreement is there, but they're not, they're not binding. The soft law provisions are a bit of a step up. They're written in aspirational, motivational, or even discretionary lang language. We can find an example um, in Article 4.4, which says a developed country party should continue taking the lead in, in emissions reduction. But again, they might be persuasive in a court of law, they might aid in interpretation, but it's highly unlikely that they will ever be considered to be binding. Hard law provisions, on the other hand, are. Uh, these are mandatory obligations which are enforceable, and we find them in uh, provisions such as Article 4.2, which essentially says every country must develop um, NDCs. The difficulty with the hard law provisions, though, is, as someone like Bodansky says, is that they're much more obligations of conduct rather than uh, obligations of result or substance. So the obligation is you must develop the NDC. Um, Paris Agreement doesn't really contain hard law obligations about the content of your NDC or, or making it enforceable. Um, and this is a reflection of countries' reluctance in the climate uh, law negotiations internationally to take on hard uh, commitments because of the effects that it might have on, on their own country. Um, and in consequence, what we see is the whole of the Paris Agreement tends to have a much softer approach um, where holding states accountable is done through things like transparency, a global stock take, um, but it doesn't have a direct, um, in, like a hard enforcement um, dispute breaking uh, mechanism. But nevertheless, with that, sorry about the frog in my throat, the climate regime does have both positive and, and uh, reactive implications for foreign direct investment. So on the preactive side, we have people like Miles and, and Laurie White, who, who say that an increase in international investment is not just a consequence of the Paris Agreement, it's a necessary requirement to fulfill its objectives. And really what that quote talks to is they're saying, um, meeting the goals of the Paris uh, agreement requires a lot of money and I think it was estimated at seven 
trillion, but that is an estimate that seems to, to change every day. More importantly for our talk today is that there are also reactive um, implications of, of the Paris Agreement. And that's that inevitably one of the tools which states are going to use, particularly those that have a very low environmental law base, is that they're going to need to pass new legislation. And that legislation is likely to be more stringent. It's also highly likely that it's in a state of flux. They might keep changing as um, climate needs become more apparent. It's not a, a certain science. We don't know everything, um, and we're going to have to be quite adaptive. And that is an anathema and it flies in the face of the underlying objective of international investment law, which likes absolute stability. And what that means is because we've got this very fluid process that's happening in the international law regime, coupled with the fact that it doesn't have its own dispute mechanism, companies that are unhappy with laws that change and that become tighter and that affect them and affect their, their bottom line, um, may have recourse to declaring an international investment law dispute where they're protected by a bit. And this is the case um, in both Angola and Cameroon when we're talking about, um, uh, about gas flaring. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing this happening increasingly. And what we are seeing is companies have a public commitment to committing to Paris. Their websites say they support it and so on, but they're resorting to these international investment law um, proceedings really suggests a different story and it's more symptomatic of the NIMBY not in my backyard approach. And I think Cecil, um, sorry, Shell um, is, is a big example of that at the moment. Right, then before I hand over to Louis, what I also want to touch on is um, why reduce gas flaring? What's the need? What's the, the potential? And the starting point here is that one of the non-state actors, which is also typically a big TNC, transnational corporation, that needs to be considered when Africans look at their approach to um, reducing climate change is the oil sector. And they are a major, major contributor to climate change, as I mentioned. They're also a sector that is often protected by bits, by bilateral um, investment treaties. One of the reasons why they are such a big contributor is because during the oil production process, methane is released and methane is a gas that contributes far more to climate change than something like um, CO2. And very often, uh, these companies flare it, they burn it off to, to get rid of it, and they convert it into CO2 in the process. But what we know is that flaring has really, really big negative health um, and environmental impacts. And this is clearly illustrated if you look at what's happening in Nigeria and the Niger Delta. It's one of the major sources of, of global uh, flaring and um, also a major source of environmental injustice. So <clears throat> the other problem with the flaring is that it's very wasteful um, because methane can be used to generate electricity. So this is a, a starkly and sad reality. Again, if we look at the Niger Delta, and I know today's talk is not about Nigeria, but the World Bank says that um, we emit and enough, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. Flaring is, is um, wasteful, and we flare enough gas to power the whole of sub Saharan Africa. And Nigeria being in the top, uh, amongst the top emitters in the world, uh, flares in the world. This is particularly sad because very many of the communities do not have access to electricity at all. It's just being burnt and they're bearing the negative effects without any of the benefits. So globally at the moment, we say that this gas flaring contributes to about 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but studies by people like Elvridge et al. Um, have said that if you reduce it, not stop it, but reduce it 
it could contribute to meeting 1.86% and 1.46% of total unconditional um, and conditional NDC targets, respectively. So while that sounds a little bit Mickey Mouse in the scheme of what we need to do in climate change, it can be very different if you look at it through the lens of specific countries. So what they also find, for example, is in the case of Angola and Cameroon, um, reducing flaring can contribute to between 5 and 20% of their unconditional targets, 15% estimated in Cameroon. They didn't provide statistics for Angola, but Angola itself um, estimates a, a far higher amount, 42% um, of unconditional targets, um, uh, sorry, of conditional targets and 31% of their conditional targets. So you can see that reducing or stopping gas flaring in those countries could be, in a way, a low hanging fruit and a really significant contribution to their mitigation efforts um, and addressing climate change. And what's important here is that both have said that they want to do exactly that. They've both signed the World Bank Zero Routine Flaring Initiative by 2030. Um, and as the name suggests, the aim of that initiative is that all routine gas flaring be stopped by, by 2030. It imposes obligations on governments to adopt appropriate legislation to stop that gas flaring. It's a little bit softer on the oil companies. What it says to the companies who sign up and commit is that for their new projects, they must commit to not having routine gas flaring. Um, but for the existing legacy sites, it uses much softer language and says that they must seek um, to reduce it and where it's uh, economically viable and so on. So that's a little bit of a get out of jail free card. Um, and what that means is when oil company doesn't voluntarily address their, their existing and their legacy sites, then um, the most obvious response for governments to get them to do something like that is, is to pass legislation. And in the case of Angola and Cameroon, they would need to do that because um, they don't have an existing legislative uh, framework in place that is um, stringent enough to, to match what they say they want to do by signing the World Bank's agreements. And I think what I'm going to do there is hand over to Louis and turn off my um, camera. Um, and Louis, I'll flip the slides for you. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I think you can page to the, to the next slide then. So just in terms of before I go into uh, these stabilization clauses and what they really mean for, for Angola and Cameroon. Um, so, so Jenny mentioned how important uh, gas, the reduction of gas flaring is for Angola specifically. And Angola also gives us figures on what this would actually cost. So for, for Angola to achieve a 75% reduction will cost 30 billion US dollars. But what we need to remember about gas flaring is that in some areas it will be, it will be cheaper to, to reduce gas flaring because you're already close to, to infrastructure and in other areas it would require more substantial investment. So to get from, from the 75% then to 91% doubles the cost. Uh, then the cost we're looking at is about 60 billion US dollars. Uh, the concern of course being that there aren't that many uh, oil companies who would voluntarily want to sign up for this $60 billion expenditure. And this $60 billion is also almost the entire GDP of Angola. So it's, it's fairly uh, substantial. Now, what I'm going to speak to today is of course the, the stabilization clauses that uh, Jenny has mentioned in the beginning is that what the stabilization clause does is it seeks to protect the investor from, from the adverse changes in laws regulating its investment. And there are, there are different types of, 
of stabilization clauses. Um, these are freezing clauses, economic equilibrium clauses, and hybrid clauses. So a freezing clause is theoretically speaking the most severe type of stabilization clause. It can be inserted in either a treaty or a contract or legislation. And what it does is it guarantees the investor that if there are any changes to the law, this would not be applied to the investor. Now, Article 12.3 of the Angola-Italy Bilateral Investment Treaty contains a freezing clause, although it is subject to, to a so-called right of election. This means that the, the investor can inform the Angolan government that it does not want Angola to apply new laws to it, including these gas flowing laws or any other laws that might be adopted for, for climate change mitigation and adaption, in, in, even labor laws in any environmental laws, uh, human rights, nothing is excluded from the scope of, of this clause. So it's extremely problematic and the investor can at any time inform the government that it must not apply these new laws to, to the investment. If the, the country then proceeds or Angola then proceeds to apply these laws to Italian investors, it would be a breach of the bilateral investment treaty. Now, there are similar clauses to the Angola Italy clause in BITs with other African countries. They don't necessarily form the, form the main focus of our discussion today, but these principles that we are discussing um, in relation to Angola and Cameroon also apply to, to other countries, um, including Mozambique and Tanzania. But then the stabilization clause that um, Italy has with Cameroon is a bit different. It does not work with a, with a right of election. It just provides if after the date of the investment, um, any laws, regulations, rules, or economic policy measures, which are enforced directly or indirectly for investors are to be amended, the same treatment will be applied as that in force at the time the investment is made. Um, so what is treatment? Treatment is a term um, in international investment law that's really broad. It refers to the entirety of your, your interactions with the investor, meaning the investor must have exactly the same conditions that they had when they entered the, the market. So this is quite problematic because if the investor, for example, entered um, Cameroon in 1990, then that investor is entitled to the exact or to have the exact same laws that were applicable in 1990 applied to it. Now, technically, the, the Bilateral Investment Treaty only entered into force in 2003, but Article 1, Paragraph 1, departs from the, from the general rule against retrospective application, and it also applies to, to pre-existing uh, investments. Now, that does not mean that if in 1998 they applied a law to an investor and then in 2003 the treaty entered into force, you can take the state to arbitration for what happened in 1998, but it is accepted in investment law that a matter can subsequently crystallize into a treaty breach, which means technically the investor was after the bet entered into force in 2003, then entitled to have all new laws that came after 1990 disapplied to this specific investor. Um, Jenny, you can go to, thank you very much. Then what we're going to talk about briefly is, is most favored nation clauses, because you might be thinking, okay, so there's a problem with Angola having signed this treaty with, with Italy, and there is an Italian company in Angola, any that is responsible for about 15% of the oil production. We don't know exactly how much of the, the flaring is done by them, but for, for purposes of this discussion, we do know that there is quite a bit of flaring done by any, and they are, of course, protected under the Italian BIT. 
But now you might be thinking that, okay, so it's only Italian investors that are then protected. But the, the concern is that international investment law or specific bits are not self-contained regimes. And this is what the, the tribunal told us already in one of the very, very first exit cases in the 1980s in AAPL versus Sri Lanka, that a bilateral investment treaty is not a self-contained regime because there are most favored nation clauses and other ways in which um, investors from one country can be entitled to the protection in another treaty. So it's quite common for investment treaties to, to contain MFN clauses. Um, I'd say more than 90% of all investment treaties contain MFN clauses. And this MFN clauses, sorry, I've slipped into the jargon that, that Jenny warned about, um, MFN clauses being most favored nation clauses. And really what a most favored nation clause says is that I will offer nationals of your state the most favored treatment that I offer to nationals of any other state. This has then been interpreted very, very broadly in uh, Vladimir Bashad versus the Russian Federation. The, the tribunal says that it is universally agreed that the very essence of an MFN provision in a bit is to afford to investors all material protection provided by subsequent treaties. Um, in an in a empirical study by, by Patrick Dunbury, he studied uh, the entirety of investment jurisprudence on the absence of FET clauses. Um, so that's fair and equitable treatment clauses where treaties don't contain FET clauses but they do contain MFN clauses. And in every instance where the investor wanted to import an FET clause, where this was absent from the treaty their state has signed, the tribunal has allowed this. Uh, the, the exception is, of course, one single case, um, Ikal versus Turkmenistan, but that was very specific based on the, the wording of the clause. Jenny, I don't know if you dropped off. Um, because I think the... she has dropped off, but I, I'm sure she'll be back in a moment. So perhaps okay, I'm just going to carry on speaking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the, the concern then, is that you can use MFN clauses to import this better standard of treatment. So it does not stop with, with Italy, although the, the treaties are with Italy, because there is a real risk that most favored nation clauses can be used to interpret or to import these provisions from other treaties. In, in white industries versus India, India argued that each treaty is specifically negotiated and with parties have really worked to, to limit the scope of a treaty. It would subvert the intention of the parties if we were to go and import this standard. But the tribunal says, no, that is not the case because by including an MFN clause, the intention of the parties was always to provide everybody with, with this uh, treatment. So in terms of MFN, there is a risk. Now there's been some academic debate which says that MFN is not as far reaching as tribunals have interpreted it. But at the end of the day, practically speaking, whether they are correct or not, this is the way they have done it almost unanimously uh, with the exception of ICAL. So how is this then different from, from contractual stabilization clauses? Because there, there are also contractual stabilization clauses so countries can agree in a contract to, to give investors this same stability. And really it comes in with the, with the heightened risk because when you, you sign a contract, it applies into parties, meaning only between the, the parties. So if oil company A signs a contract with Angola, really this protection is only given to, to oil company A. 
And a contractual breach is not automatically a treaty breach. So often what we have seen is that when these cases go to court and the investor comes to court with the, with the contractual stabilization clause, the court says, well, actually, the government has exceeded the scope of its authority. The, the executive branch of government cannot say that an investment won't be, be regulated. So the contract is then declared unlawful. So you don't necessarily have that contractual protection domestically, but contractual clauses can still be relevant to fair and equitable treatment or enforced if a treaty contains an umbrella clause. Um, the, the tribunal in El Paso Energy versus Ecuador tells us that not every contractual clause can be enforced under an umbrella clause, but a stabilization clause can, because there the state acted with, with sovereign authority. Now, if there is an umbrella clause, the stabilization clause can be enforced, the contractual stabilization clause can be enforced, even if the domestic courts declared the entirety of the contract unlawful, because this is then elevated to an international breach, which exists entirely independently of domestic law. So that is, contractual stabilization clauses are less severe but that does not mean they're not cause for, for concern. It's more challenging to, to enforce them in investment law, at least in, in theory, um, especially if there's not an umbrella clause. But again, if there is not an umbrella clause, but there's an MFN clause, you can potentially use the MFN clause to import the umbrella clause and then enforce your contract in that way. Um, but that's, that's quite a, a complicated process to follow and we're not going to, to get stuck on on that point. And again, it would only apply to that specific oil company and not every investor who's protected by, by that treaty or another treaty with an MFN clause. The, the Zambian experience with contractual stabilization clauses really shows us how far reaching the effects of stabilization clauses are because many times the stabilization clause never actually needs to be enforced to, to actually have a negative effect on state's ability to, to regulate. So in 2008, as the, the world financial crisis came in, uh, Zambia sought to, to up taxes on the mining industry and many foreign mining companies were protected by, by stabilization clauses and to to placate these investors, Angola negotiated with them extensively to water down, uh, not Angola, Zambia, to water down the legislation. And at the end of the day, none of those investors paid those taxes anyway. So now everybody else got the, the weaker legislation because Zambia thought, okay, if we do this, they'll accept it. They never did. They never ended up paying those taxes, even though no case was ever filed because the threat of a case is good enough. Then there are also legislative stabilization clauses. Again, they are somewhat more restricted than, than treaty stabilization clauses, although they extend to a greater number of investors than contractual stabilization clauses. And often legislative stabilization clauses are not in themselves a stabilization clause. They authorize the government to enter into a stabilization clause. But like treaty-based stabilization clauses, legislative stabilization clauses did not really get much attention in terms of the, the literature until it did. Um, and this is very much the way it works in investment law. There are terrible provisions out there and we tend to ignore them until it's too late. And the Italian treaties are particularly problematic in this respect. So um, using a quick example of what I mean here, if we look at, at Syria, I'm sure everybody is aware that Syria is engaged in a, in a civil war. So in its treaty with Italy, Syria agrees to strict liability for any losses that investors suffer during the war, 
And in the Guris case, what happened is Turkish investors said, oh, but you have a treaty where you create a strict liability regime to Italian investors by virtue of MFN, we're entitled to the same treatment and the tribunal agrees with them and grants that. So even if the, the treaty against Angola has not been invoked, because this clause has never been invoked against um, Angola, or at least officially in official proceedings, um, it does not mean that it's not, not a threat. But in terms of legislative stabilization clauses, these also didn't present a a problem or they were largely ignored until the case of Ramali Telecom versus the Republic of Kazakhstan. And there the, the tribunal looked at a Kazakh investment law that had been repealed. So the, the tribunal said that Article 6.1, that's of the Kazakh investment law, grants foreign investors protection against adverse changes in legislation for a period of 10 years from the date they made their investment or the entire duration of the contract exceeding 10 years entered into with authorized state bodies. This is the case here. What Ramali tells us is if you agreed to a legislative stabilization clause, even if the legislature revokes that legislation or repeals that legislation, so the stabilization clause no longer exists under the instrument that it was granted, that gives rise to an application of the doctrine of acquired rights. When that law was in place, that investor became entitled to that stability by taking away that stability, the state acts in breach of its international obligations, and you cannot take away this acquired right, which means, again, you need to compensate the investor for any cost that it incurs in complying with this new law. Now, theoretically, going back to, to our discussion on on freezing clauses and economic equilibrium clauses, the freezing clause says that you can't regulate, but investment tribunals don't have an army to, to send to force the state not to regulate. So what they do is they order compensation and they're quite effective um, at investors actually getting the money. If we look at Tanzania, for example, Tanzania did not want to settle an investment award. So an attachment order was obtained against its national airline in Canada. And until it settled the award, its plane could not be released. So this area of international law is quite effective in terms of enforcement. But then in terms of legislative stabilization clauses in Cameroon, we see the Petroleum Code of Cameroon. Um, that's a new law. It entered, or relatively new, it entered into force in 2019 and it repeals and replaces the 2003 Petroleum Code in Cameroon. And it says that the petroleum contract may provide for special regimes with regard to the stabilization of economic conditions particularly where conditions for the execution of the said petroleum contract are aggravated by the introduction in the Republic of Cameroon of laws or regulations after its effective date. This is an economic equilibrium uh, provision in its purest sense. So what it says, the legislation authorizes the Ministry of Petroleum to sign a contract in which it agrees to uh, an economic equilibrium clause, meaning if you adopt new legislation, you are under an obligation to compensate the investor for the cost of compliance. It restores the economic equilibrium. You might think, what then is the difference between an economic equilibrium clause and a freezing clause because both ultimately get to compensation. And in instances where the clause is drafted widely, then the distinction is purely academic. Practically, there is no, no difference. But in most instances, economic 
the clauses are subject to specific additional conditions. Um, so this, this authorizes you to, to enter into the economic equilibrium clause. So what it then says um, is that, for example, it excludes human rights or labor or environment in the contract itself. This again does not happen uniformly, but it brings us back to legislative stabilization clauses and contract-based stabilization clauses being more, more limited than treaty-based stabilization clauses, but we should not think that these are not a threat. And there are ways in which you can work towards um, eliminating a contractual stabilization clause because you can renegotiate the contract with the, with the investor. And in many instances, investors are willing to renegotiate contracts for various reasons. Um, and also those clauses are often set to, to very specific expiry time periods. But going back to the, to the problem with, with treaty-based stabilization clauses. How do you exit this regime? How does the state essentially regain its power to regulate uh, foreign investors? So the Angola Italy BIT will remain in force until 2027. It will then automatically renew for a further five years unless denounced by either of the parties. So in 2027, Angola can send a, a note for Baal or a, a diplomatic communication to Italy and say to Italy, look, we want to terminate this treaty uh, or denounce it as, as the formal term goes. If they denounce it in 2027, it is subject to a five year sunset clause, which means that investors will, who invested before 2027 will still be able to bring claims against Angola for any changes to the law until 2032. If it renews in 2027, it's not denounced, it renews until 2032, it will then expire in 2032, but investors who invested before 2032 will be entitled to protection until 2037, um, which is quite a, a long time. And really Angola does not have this time on its side because it needs to adopt this legislation to eliminate flaring in order to comply with its environmental obligations by 2030. And as the World Bank says, adopting the legislation by 2030 is also already too late because you need to adopt the legislation years in advance because investments that start to be, or if you start to eliminate flaring now or putting in place the infrastructure, that infrastructure will only uh, be operational close to, to 2030, it takes quite some time. But we'll, we'll talk to, uh, to, to a solution on this point briefly. Then the Cameroon Italy bit has no set expiry date, but either party may denounce it by giving the other party one year's notice of its intention to terminate the agreement. So if Cameroon were to send a, a notice to to Italy today, that treaty would then terminate in one year from now, and the five-year sunset clause would then run from 14 October 2022 until 13 October 2027. Uh, again, it's much, much too late then for, for Cameroon to, to begin adopting uh, legislation. So, the reality is that it's not as simple as saying, oh, we are denouncing the bit. So what do we do? Well, really, the, the only thing that we can do is we need a spirit of cooperation from Italy. Italy needs to cooperate with Angola and Cameroon to denounce the bit collectively 
together with its sunset clause. This was done by the European Union when it terminated its intra-EU BITs. They also agreed to terminate the sunset clauses. And this is really the only way that countries can get out of the bits. But the reality is if Italy does not cooperate in terminating it, it's probably still better for Cameroon to consider denouncing this treaty and Angola because the risks here are, are very high. So when Egypt, for example, had to pay Union for NOSA in an arbitral award, it was 7% of its budget for the year. Um, we saw a recent award against Ecuador um, in, in relation to Perenco, Perenco who also polluted um, all over Ecuador. And what they did is they said to Ecuador, okay, we'll deduct $100 million from the amount so that you can use that for environmental remediation, but you must still pay Perenco an additional $350 million uh, for the unfair manner in which you had treated their investment. So the amounts are large, especially for developing countries like Cameroon and Angola. And when we're talking about gas flaring, it's really expensive. Um, not everybody has $60 billion lying around, but I'd be really, really interested in hearing your thoughts as well. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And just the last word from, from my side, so I suppose what I'd, I'd take her message is, is we've looked at one aspect of international investment law, which is stabilization clauses, but we have this, this crushing urgency to say all countries need to do something to address climate change. And then we've got this sort of lurking in the shadows body of law that says um, the polluter pays principle may be a feature of international environmental law, but it doesn't bother us at all. So if you want to take your climate change measures, take them. Um, but you, we either don't comply or you need to pay us. You need to pay us a lot of money. And that money that you pay us is for our personal um, motivation. We are not obliged to spend it on climate mitigation. So it's like salt into the wounds where you can pay these companies all these millions or billions of dollars. And I don't know, directors could um, buy beach houses in Bermuda or something. They still don't have to stop... Um, their, their polluting activities. So this is really a chilling effect where either African countries may not want to take the measures or where while we're racing to get countries to contribute to financing climate change mitigation adaptation um, that's so sorely needed, we're saying you better raise a lot more because you're going to have to pay private transnational corporations every time you want to do something good for all of us. Okay, the hand back to Melanie to see if there's any questions and apologies, I dropped off, so I haven't been able to look at the chat or anything, just trying to stay stable. Thank you both. Um, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking about how there's a need for massive reform of international law if we're going to solve climate change. Um, because what these provisions seem to do is entrench existing global north global south injustice and um, uh, existing patterns of of colonization and extractivism and to respond to climate change we need laws that facilitate the opposite and that's that's what paris claims to do but um, it seems that paris is stifled by the existing international investment laws that you were speaking about. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in general on, on the justice dimensions and, and broader reforms. And if that ties in with Kate's question um, about um, how it's indeed chilling if one considers the strides governments, governments are trying to make in the context of climate mitigation, um, your presentation, um, and the insulation these clauses can provide to otherwise non-compliant companies. Um, 
what uh, Kate would like to know is, can other international law mechanisms be used to compel parties to cooperate in phasing out these problematic clauses? Um, and then from Rose, we have the question, what is a viable solution if gas flaring is so expensive for countries like Cameroon to sponsor that are being affected by gas flaring? Um, so yeah, I think over to both of you to, to respond to those questions for now. Do, do you want to start, Jenny, or? No, off you go, Louis. Okay. So, <laughs> Otherwise we'll interrupt each other like we normally do. <laughs> so to, to Kate's question is, can other international law mechanisms be used to compel parties to cooperate? And, and that's really um, an interesting question that you, that you raise, um, because in theory, yes, um, but also not the way it's necessarily framed it at the moment. So we do have obligations to cooperate in, in international environmental law, but if those obligations go quite far enough to say, oh, you are compelled to cooperate to, to terminate these other treaties is quite a, a different question altogether. We are seeing some incremental reforms in international investment law. And I call them incremental because it's almost like investment tribunals are, are pretending that they're not there. Um, and that we saw we saw very recently in a decision in, in Echo Oro International, where the Canada and Colombia entered into to a new investment agreement and they included an environmental exception where they said that environmental measures excludes um, compensation and the problem being that they didn't say it that way <laughs> they didn't say explicitly that it excludes compensation but in Canada made non-disputing party submissions to the tribunal and said look when Colombia and us agree to this agreement this was exactly our intention it was for it to be an exception for environmental measures but the tribunal says it could not have been the intention of the parties to exclude compensation um, because ultimately not paying compensation is not necessary for the protection of the environment. You need to prove as a state, if you want to rely on an environmental exception, that it's necessary for the protection of the environment not to pay compensation. So we are going to need to see a much, much more radical shift in the way we do reforms as well. And right now, states are talking about reforms at the UNCTRAL working group. But South Africa, um, that's one thing about South Africa, we've made very, very good submissions to the UNCTRAL working group where we said, listen, we are focusing on one problem, but the problem is much bigger because UNCTRAL is only working on procedural issues like a doctrine of precedent and appeals. But if the precedents are bad, do we necessarily want precedents? So it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword there as well. I don't know if you want to speak to to Rose's question, Jenny, and I see there are quite a few questions coming in. Yes, as well. let, let me let me take that one, and that's Watson I know because she's one of our LLM students. Um, so uh, you're asking if if it's so expensive for Cameroon to sponsor stopping gas flaring, is there another alternative? Well, I suppose let me reverse the question and say the oil companies have been making massive, massive profits for years and years and years while contributing to a problem that we are now all sitting with, which is, which is climate change. And we have a principle in international environmental law, which is polluter pays. So one of the tensions that's always come up in the, in the climate negotiations is where it's going to have a big economic impact and people shy away and they want to step back from it. So on the one hand, we talk about the principle of sustainable development and we say we'll make nice and we'll balance economic issues with environmental ones. When it comes to, to being to the price tag being put on something, then people seem to say, well, maybe the economic issue is a little bit more important than the environmental one. And that's, that's the trap that we've got into. So where we at with climate change now, everything is going to have to be re-examined, a radical change, and we can't keep, keep simply talking about 
um, economic impacts been a reason to not do it. So we've seen that with COVID. I mean, two years ago, if we said we will shut down economies across the world, we will ground airlines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if that was in the context of a, a climate negotiation, countries would have just rebelled unconditionally, but we've done it and we will survive it. So the thing is to maybe put the shoe in the other foot and say, oil companies, you've you've reaped the rewards. Now it's time to give back. You have to do your bit too. Yeah, and uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about what might the implications be of, of the Human Rights Council recognizing a human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, if that might shift the the regime slightly or where the emphasis lies um, or create some potential for further arguments against these kind of um, problematic clauses. And um, then we have a question about whether there are legislative bodies either within countries or, or internationally who can, can help, I suppose the idea, the, the question is about preventing or regulating these agreements that given that they're prejudicial to African countries um, or, or is it just that the countries are desperate for money <laughs> um, and then the um, there's a question as well about um, why are our countries reluctant to use gas gas flaring to to generate electricity um, is it a financial issue or is it um, because of negative impacts on production or profitability. Um, and, and I think that that gives us a bit more uh, flesh to, to get into. And then we'll go to Mohammed, who has a, a question uh, that he'd like to raise verbally. Why don't you start with those two? Uh, Louis, do you want to take a first crack at the so, legislative so, bodies? Yes, yeah, so I'll quickly speak to to that. Um, so part of the, the discussions in the UNCTRAL working group is that um, some African countries, have, and not only African countries, uh, some developed countries have really asked if there can be an investment law advisory center where they can go and really be advised on the consequences of these treaties. Um, and if you if you have time, I'd, I'd really recommend that you you read the Republic of Mali's submissions to, to the UNCTRAL working group, where they're quite candid in saying that the reality is these treaties aren't negotiated. The, the power imbalance between a country like Mali and a developed country like Germany is, is so severe that there's little scope for negotiation. Additionally, there really isn't the expertise on investment law and what it means. So there's really that gap um, in terms of the, the knowledge base within African governments. So often these treaties are signed um, sort of like as a political gesture of friendship without necessarily considering the consequences or what those provisions mean. And again, the problem is that we became complacent because the exit convention was open for signature in 1965. Um, it entered into force in 1966. It entered into force mostly with the support of African countries. The exit convention would never have entered into force, at least back then, if it didn't have so many African states ratifying it. But between 1965 and 1990, we didn't see um, many investment law cases coming forward. This really started surging in the 2000s. Again, now we're speaking of reform treaties. 90% of the cases that are coming to tribunals is based on those old treaties. It's not the new treaties that the claims are being brought on. Because frankly, I would also, if I was an investor, prefer to bring my claim under a treaty where I'm given extensive rights uh, versus a, a more limited treaty. So it's really, we need to see states understanding the consequences. And there's some work on this 
uh, to have an advisory body. It won't have any powers to, to legislate or regulate, but it would maybe at least give these African governments the, the requisite information they need. I think on, on the other question, we've got Lachani, great to see first year students joining us, um, but asking <clears throat> why gas flaring isn't being converted into electricity and, and why we aren't doing that. Um, I can safely say, Lachani, that it would be unwise for you to take input from, from Louis or myself on the technicalities of how an oil industry works, because that's, that's really not in our field of expertise. Um, but the implication has always been, if you look at all the litigation that's happened in, in Nigeria, is that it has been profit driven. It's get in, get the cash, um, get out. Um, there's been a lot of what we call greenwashing, which is what companies do when they speak environmental language on one hand, but on the other hand, what they do in practice is, is not good. So if you look at the Niger Delta in, in Nigeria, it literally... Um, and there's UN reports and it has layers and layers of oil. Um, people have lost their fishing grounds. They've lost homes. Uh, the social injustice that's happened there is extreme. So it's been a lack of um, corporate responsibility. And I think also when these, these things started, companies went really with the program that they need a social license to operate. These are all the world's resources. It's not just for one or two people. And you need a social license to operate and you need to understand the context that you operating in and be sensitive to that and give back. And so that that hasn't um, happened. Thanks, uh, Jenny and Louis. Let's go now to Mohammed before we return to to the questions emerging in the chat. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, apologies for the background noise. Um, yeah, I've got three questions, two directly related to the presentation and one um, just based on, on, I'd like to ask, hear your opinion. So firstly, um, regarding the telecom versus uh, Kazakhstan case that was in Louis' uh, presentation, yeah, how would that work out in terms of a carbon tax uh, being implemented in South Africa? And yeah, secondly, um, uh, based on, on Clive's question in the chat, um, within the, the re-IPP program and within the context of a just transition, there's a lot of focus on localization efforts and try to build a South African base for manufacturing for renewable energy um, as we go into this fossil fuel, fossil fuel phase out. So how would that work against uh, these investment uh, constraints uh, in terms of the, the WTO? And my third question is basically there's, um, what's your opinions on uh, these various proposals that would assist to bail out ESCOM, if I could say? There's four, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, one regarding um, a sovereign debt write-off that was clouded by David Monsanto, the Deputy Finance Minister. And uh, a second was concessionary finance that would help recapitalize ESCOM generation units. Etc. And there's been a few others uh, regarding um, uh, concessionary funding from DFIs in terms of um, what's it called, enabling the just transition, uh, enabling uh, decommissioning of coal power plants and uh, repurposing them for other uses. Thanks. I'm not sure if I got all of those questions because uh, it, it, it wasn't great um, uh, quality of. of bandwidth or, or whatever, but maybe just a quick start and, and Louis can take over. I certainly missed the first question. Um, I heard you mention renewables and I'm not sure if I'm following the question correctly, but I suppose today, because this is where Louis and I get particularly indignant, is the dirty polluters getting away and getting paid to carry on polluting. But these issues under international investment law don't make the renewable sector immune either. So we've seen an enormous amount of litigation where people have tried to do renewable stuff um, with um, arbitrations and disputes being declared because people want to challenge that and they want to challenge that on the basis that it's um, uh, compromising the bits and infringing the bits and unfair advantage and so on. So the renewables have, have also had a problem. 
In terms of of um, ESCOM, I haven't personally sat down and had the opportunity yet to really examine what is, is being proposed. What we do know, though, is that this week, um, sometimes South Africa ranks highly in the world where in rankings you just don't want to compete. In. And ESCOM is now officially the world's biggest polluter of SO2 um, because of the lack of mitigation measures that that it's put in. I think what is a non-negotiable with ESCOM on its own figures, it admits that it is killing people, mostly um, people in poor communities that are adjacent to it. Other people estimate that it's a, a lot higher than what ESCOM concedes to. We've seen the flagrant um, non-compliance with standards. We've now seen um, prosecution on the basis of that, but but also misrepresentation of figures that they do give. So ESCOM is an issue where it it, it absolutely has to um, be sorted out. But Louis, I didn't quite catch the question, so you might want to add to, to what I've said. Yes, uh, thank you. So the, the first question that um, Mohammed had was, was really about Ramali, and he was asking how that would, uh, for example, affect a, a carbon tax in South Africa. So fortunately, Mohammed, South Africa does not have any bits with, with stabilization clauses. We have other problematic bits, but I'll, I'll get to that now. Um, so fortunately, we don't have any BITs with, um, with stabilization clauses, nor do we have legislation with stabilization clauses, the exception being the Mineral and Petroleum uh, Resources Development Royalties Act, which authorizes the Minister of Finance to enter into stabilization agreements, uh, but that's only in respect of royalties. So, so that stabilization clause does not go beyond that. That then is still problematic because if we want to increase royalties on minerals, we would not be able to do that because we have authorized the minister to enter into this um, stabilization clause. If the minister has done so, we won't be able to, to increase those taxes at least. Uh, so, from, so from that perspective, at least South Africa is a bit better. But when we, for example, look at our treaty with France, um, which we have terminated. We terminated our, our treaty with France in 2014, uh, but that treaty is subject to a 20 year sunset clause, which means French investors are still entitled to protection under that treaty until 2034. And that treaty contains a defined FET clause where it says that any restriction on the exploitation of raw materials or fuels would automatically, in law or in fact, amount to a breach of fair and equitable treatment. So if we, for example, decide we want to, to prohibit coal mining, and there are investors who can rely on th that treaty, either because they are French or through another treaty because of the MFN provision, they would automatically be entitled to compensation because of the way that clause is drafted. So, so there we don't quite have the, the stabilization problem in South Africa, but we have a similar problem in terms of our FET clause. So Ramali for South Africa is not that bad, but for our neighbors uh, like Mozambique, it's, it's a different story altogether. And if we wanted to increase taxes like mineral royalties, and the Minister of Finance had entered into such agreement, then we, we would run into that problem. Then in terms of localization, that's also um, um, quite complex. Now, sometimes, uh, and a degree of localization could be, could theoretically be justifiable. I must disclose though, that I'm not an expert on, on WTO law, although I do um, work and trade law, my work and trade law is very focused on regional trade law, um, not necessarily all provisions of, of the GATT, but it can easily run into problems there. But more specifically in relation to today's talk, there's an increased trend towards including such clauses in bits as well, where we say that local content requirements are prohibited. So if the, the bit 
uh, prohibits local content, then the investor would also be able to, to challenge that in investment arbitration. So yes, with localization, there is, is also definitely quite um, challenges, both in WTO law, um, although here I must disclose, I'm no expert on, on WTO law, but even in investment law, you can uh, run into problems with localization quite quickly. Thank you both. Um, really interesting to learn about South Africa's position because I think ideally we, we would want to increase taxes and ultimately stop coal mining. <laughs> um, but you've highlighted some, some problems there. But we have time for, I think, the, these last two questions and then we must wrap up and also award our prize for, for the session. Um, and so th there's one quite meaty question from Clive uh, and then a slightly shorter question from, from Rose. But Rose asks, can stabilization clauses be seen as a risk management tool? And if so, do they not impact a country's ability to implement environmental regulations? Um, so it seems to be a lot of kind of conflicting international environmental law principles at play here, state sovereignty, um, you know, intergenerational equity um, are, just, are just two that come to mind and, and how are all of these taken into account in, in this context? And then Clive asks, um, he says he found your presentations compelling and uh, he asks, what is your assessment of the effectiveness of the Protection of Investment Act of South Africa in respect of climate change since it has an express provision that requires the protection of the environment? Also, how do you balance the climate change requirements or constraints against WTO laws, such as the agreement on technical barriers to trade, which shun trade restrictive measures? So I, I think let's close with those two questions and then we'll award our, our prize um, that was in, uh, in the registration form. Thanks. Okay, I think quick comment because I can see that we, we're running short of time. Um, in response to the first one that you raised, yes, absolutely. Um, stabilization clauses really do have an impact on, on whether a country can um, implement environmental regulations. Because in some cases, like the freezing clauses that, that Louis mentioned, you are yielding your sovereign right. Lily mentioned that, and you and you, they're bumping up against a whole lot of international environmental law principles like like polluter pays and intergenerational justice, as we said. But the way the arbitration awards are playing out um, in in the exit cases and so on is there is sometimes a recognition for public policy, but public policy often has to yield to the interests of the private investors and uh, exit awards are, are very pro-friendly. So you have one of two things. You either have a country having what we call a chilling effect where they don't want to pass the regulations for the threat of these kind of um, disputes that can be declared, or they run the risk that if they pass the legislation, they have to have the cash to pay and the cash might be a lot more than that country can, can afford. So that's a quick answer. But as I said, that is one of my LLM students. So she is welcome to take it further with me offline. <clears throat> Louis, I think you started touching on, on Clive's question. I don't know if there's anything you want yes, to amplify so there. I've spoken to, to the second part of, of Clive's question because that's what Mohammed asked as well. Um, in terms of the Protection of Investment Act, Clive, what we do need to remember is that is a deliberate and conscious departure from the way bits have been interpreted. And you'll see with a lot of the, the sections in the Protection of Investment Act, they were inserted specifically because of the way investment treaties have been interpreted in the past. But some of the standards in the Protection of Investment Act is still quite vague um, and it would be interesting to see how that plays out in court but yes it does explicitly recognize environmental protection and what we must also remember is that the protection of investment act for the most part um, subjects everything to to the constitution itself so it's not the same as the bits that being said though 
we can still be taken to arbitration under the birds because we cannot um, take away investors' right to, to go to arbitration, even though the treaties are terminated because of the sunset clause, unless we negotiate with these other countries such as France and Italy to, to terminate the, the bits. Um, and some of our bits only expired this year. So it's a, it's a very mixed picture in terms of the, the bits that are still out there for, for South Africa, but we've terminated many, but most of them can still be used until around 2034. Thank you very much, Melanie. Great, thanks. Um, and so just to conclude, we, we need to thank Jenny and Louis very much. It's wonderful to have them as members of the ELA, but also as um, um, this, a subcommittee of the executive in Gauteng. And for them to have held this wonderful webinar that really brought to attention some very novel and important issues. And um, I see there's a request for a part two. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to, to host a part two next year. And uh, to find out more about our events, follow us on, on Facebook um, and Instagram and LinkedIn. And um, we, we host regular events and we'd love to have um, continued interest. Uh, it, it's the best, um, input from UJ that we've had so far at any of our events and we'd really love to grow our relationship with UJ. We're also uh, developing a student subcommittee so if any of the students who are here with us today are interested in forming part of that student subcommittee please reach out to us you can get our details off our website that's elasa.co.za ELA and um, then we had some really brilliant quest answers in, in response to the question, how do multinational corporations um, undermine climate ambition in Africa? And um, I'll share some of these on our website for the event so that you can get a sense of what students are thinking. I, it's mainly student responses. So thank you to the, the students for, for really being active and engaging with this problem. And um, you know, we there are a lot of thoughts on on multinational corporations. But when we learn about company law and university, to what extent do we problematize it? And I know for my part, um, when I studied company law at UCT, it was taught very black letter, not as something that's that's fundamentally entrenching colonialism and and causing massive environmental degradation around the world. And I, I really think we need to be pushing for reform in company law in, in general and, and the way it's taught. And, and I think Jenny and, and Louis are part of that movement. And, and so I, I really want to congratulate them for, for taking us forward in this area. Um, and then just to get to the, so the, I'll read very briefly the two, um, the top two answers that we had for today's, um, talk um, and then I'll, I'll announce the, the winner who gets a, a free membership for the ELA and, and as part of that access to a, a great deal of information, opportunities, um, the potential to win other prizes. We do book prizes at other events that are only available to members. So um, it's, a, it's a great, oh, and also the opportunity to be on a specialist directory on our website. Um, that is reserved for members. And, and that's of course a, a platform for, for marketing. So um, the two best answers were from um, Samantha Smith, whose answer was um, MNCs disregard local laws or don't strictly follow envi local environmental practices, which leads to the environment being damaged further when they come to developing countries who don't have strong legislation, or I would say also enforcement of that legislation, protecting the environment. MNCs also sometimes will outsource some of the parts of production to developing countries as, as they have weaker environmental legislation, thus finding loopholes to their country's legislation and damaging the environment. And um, then also from Davi Ramila, 
who answered investor expectations are generally how claims of fair and equal treatment and indirect expropriation in ISDS arise. For Africa's environmental ambitions, this means that the possibility of introduction of environmental regulations risk, um, sorry, my eyes are very tired, <laughs> risk the possibility of violating investor expectations, which in essence are much easier to offend owing to the current dearth of environmental regulations in many countries on the continent. The further possibility of incurring liability for regulating against a broad spectrum of investments, including those held by large MNCs, as well as the attendant expensive legal fees, can be quite persuasive to a deterrent um, to any meaningful environmental regulation. And um, of course, uh, both answers very interesting. And um, we, we have decided to award the membership prize to Davi and we'll be in touch with Davi about uh, awarding that prize. Um, and uh, so congratulations and thank you to everyone who participated in the competition. Um, and really, we hope we'll see you in future events uh, as part of um, building the, the ELA's um, uh, goal of environmental education and awareness and advancing the right to a healthy environment in South Africa and elsewhere in the continent. And um, please also we'll share the details of this recording and please share it with any friends or or colleagues or anyone else who might be interested in listening to Louis and Jenny's presentation. Thank you so much.